Short-sighted people follow the path of the pleasant, which leads to bondage. The far-sighted tread the path of the highest good, which leads to liberation. As an ant sifts sugar from a mixture of sugar and sand, so a calm soul discriminates between these two paths and follows the latter. The path of the highest good is very rough and steep, that is why few succeed. Those who poses a pure character relinquish worldly pleasures and seek spiritual bliss. It truly takes great effort to develop a noble character, but when it is formed, it is a source of tremendous energy and gigantic willpower. Only a person of noble character can be a true spiritual teacher and a great leader. Swami Akhandananda spoke of how hard he worked to make his character strong and pure when he was a teenage boy. I was extremely orthodox in those days and scrupulously observed all the Brahmanical customs in accordance with the scriptural injunctions. For example, I used to bathe four times a day in the Ganges without applying any oil to my body and as a result my skin and hair became very dry. I was a vegetarian and cooked my own food. I was in the habit of chewing a myrobalan, a kind of bitter nut, after meals, so my lips became white. I used to practice pranayam, breathing exercises, along with my other morning and evening spiritual disciplines. I increased the volume of pranayam so much that our NY body began to perspire and shiver. I practiced kumbhaka, breath retention, by diving into the Ganges and grabbing a stone. I was fascinated by this play with the prana one. Swami Akhandananda was born as Gangadhar Gangopadhyay on 30th September 1864 in the Aheritola area of Western Calcutta. His father, Srimanta Gangopadhyay, was a priest and Sanskrit teacher who also practiced yoga and tantra. Gangadhar's mother, Vamsundari, was a devout woman. After having three daughters, she prayed to God for a son, and thus Gangadhar was born. Gangadhar was a vivacious, handsome boy. When he was eight years old, he had a large abscess between his eyebrows. He told the doctor to perform the surgery without anesthesia. The doctor was amazed at his stoicism. Gangadhar was extremely intelligent and memorized the Gita and Upanishads. As a small child, he mastered the English alphabet in one day. Gangadhar was admitted to the Oriental Seminary, but he was not particularly interested in formal education. From his very childhood, Gangadhar was so compassionate that he once gave his own shirt to a poor classmate whose shirt was torn. Without telling his parents, he would secretly give food to beggars. He was a strong moralist and always helped his wavered friends. Gangadhar was a close friend of Surendra Ghosh, a son of the famous dramatist and actor Girish Chandra Ghosh. Together they formed an amateur theatrical party in North Calcutta. Gangadhar took roles in several dramas and earned some repute as an actor. But his theatrical ability could not hold in check his deep spiritual inclination. Gangadhar was fascinated by the mendicants and by their stories about the holy places of India. He cherished a desire to see the Himalayas and the ashramas of the ancient sages. When Gangadhar was twelve, he was invested with the sacred thread. Thereafter, he repeated the Gayatri Mantram three times a day. Often he would make an image of Lord Shiva out of clay and worship him with bill leaves and Ganges water. In 1877 Gangadhar and his friend Harinath met Sri Ramakrishna at Dinanath Basu's house in Bagbazar. Seeing the master in Samadhi, Gangadhar's spiritual longing increased. Sometimes he would go to the cremation ground and imbibe the mood of renunciation by observing the impermanence of human life. Seeing Gangadhar's monastic tendencies, his mother was eager to arrange his marriage. Knowing her intention, Gangadhar said, Mother, arrange my marriage quickly and bring another mother home. She will help you in cooking and other household work. 
to Gangadhar's mother understood the pure nature of her son, who considered all women to be his mother. After that she never again pestered him about getting married. At twelve, Gangadhar met a monk at the Sarvamangala temple in Kosipore and left home with him without informing his parents. His parents wept for their only son and searched for him in Varanasi, Vindavan, Hardwar and other holy places. As it turned out, however, Gangadhar had gone to Budvan, sixty miles from Calcutta. The monk suggested that he return home as he was too young for monastic life. When he did, his parents were overjoyed to have him home again, in the company of Sri Ramakrishna. In May 1883, when he was 19, Gangadhar visited Sri Ramakrishna at Dakshineswar. The master received Gangadhar cordially and made him sit on his small cot. He then asked, Have you ever seen me before? Yes, Gangadhar replied. I saw you once when I was very young at the house of Dinanath Basu in Calcutta. The elder Gopal was also present. Addressing him, the master said with a smile, O oh Gopal, listen to this. This boy says that he met me when he was very young. This little one had an early boyhood. Three Gangadhar looked exceptionally young for his age and moreover, he had a childlike demeanour. Gangadhar later recalled his dot first meetings with the master. In the afternoon the master asked me to go to the Panchavati after saluting the deities at the Kali and Vishnu temples. Later in the evening, as I returned to the master's room, I heard music being played from the two Nahabats, concert towers, and the temple garden was filled with the melodious sound of the Vesper bells. The master's room was dark, and there was a sweet smell of incense. The master was seated on his cot, barely visible. He did not have any outer consciousness. As he had asked me to stay overnight at the temple garden, I did so. The next morning, when I was about to leave for Calcutta, he said to me with a smile, Come again on Saturday. After a few days I went to Sri Ramakrishna for the second time on a Saturday and I was again made to stay overnight. In the evening, after the Vesper service was over, the master handed me a mat and asked me to spread it on the western veranda. He took his pillow and sat down on the mat. He then asked me to sit in a comfortable posture and to meditate. It is not good to sit leaning forward or to hold the body too straight, he said. That evening the master initiated me by writing a mantram on my tongue. He then lay down putting his feet on my lap and asked me to give them a little massage. I was quite strong as I practiced wrestling. No sooner had I begun to press his feet than he cried out, What are you doing? The legs will be crushed. Press them gently. Immediately I realized how soft and tender the master's body was, as if his bones were covered with butter. I was embarrassed and I asked with some fear, how then should I massage? Pass your hands over them gently, he replied. Niranjan also did like you at first, for on weekends many devotees would come to visit the master. In order to avoid the crowd, Gangadhar would go on weekdays, sometimes he would stay overnight. This enabled Ramakrishna to imprint his way of life and teachings on the mind of his young disciple. Gangadhar reminisced. One morning Sri Ramakrishna asked me to accompany him to the Panchavati and there he told me to meditate facing the east. He left for a while and when he came back he set my body straight. He remarked, you become a bit bent during meditation, we then returned to his room. After that he asked me to carry a water pot and go with him to the Chandani, the bathing ghat on the Ganges. He had his bath and returned to his room in his wet cloth. Before he put on his fresh cloth he asked me to sprinkle a little Ganges water on it. There was a picture of Mother Kali of Kaligat 
Calcutta, in his room, which he saluted. Then he ate a little dry prasad of Lord Jagannath and gave some to me. Standing in front of the picture of Kali, he said several times, Om Kali. He then put the palm of his right hand on his chest with the three middle fingertips touching the palm and he stood there with half-closed eyes for some time. After that he took the offered fruits and sweets that had been sent to him from the Kali and Vishnu temples. He then drank a little bill sherbet and gave me the prasad, after which he sat on his small cot and smoked from a hubble bubble. When the food offering was over in the temples, the master took me to the eastern veranda of his room and said, Go and take the prasad of Mother Kali. It is cooked in Ganges water and is very holy. I agreed. While walking through the courtyard, I looked back and noticed that the master was watching whether I was going to the kitchen of the Vishnu or Kali temple. I wondered why he had asked me to go to the non-vegetarian kitchen of Kali instead of the vegetarian kitchen of Vishnu. I did what the master said, but I ate only the vegetarian dishes. I still remember the thick preparation of chana dal lentils. When I returned to the master's room, I found him waiting near the east door with a betel roll in his hand. Giving it to me, he said, chew it. It is good to chew a couple of betel rolls after meals. It removes bad breath. Sometimes I would think, the master says that most of my habits, such as taking only self-cooked food, being a vegetarian, practicing austerity, chewing my robolin, and so on are for old people. If they are not good, why shouldn't I give them up? One day I visited the master and had prasad at the temple. A group of lay devotees came after his noon rest and I spread a mat for them on the floor. One of them asked the master, Sir, is it good that these young boys come to you to embrace the monastic life, disregarding the householder's life? The master replied, Look, you only see their present life and not their previous lives in which they passed through these other stages. For instance, a man has four sons. One of them, having grown up, says, I shall not put oil on my body or eat fish. I shall eat only self-cooked vegetarian food. The parents try to dissuade him from these habits and even threaten him but the boy will not give up the path of renunciation. Yet the other three sons are set on enjoyment and swallow whatever they get. Look, it is because of the preponderance of Sattva that this boy wants to renounce everything before he reaches manhood. Listening to this from the Master, my faith in keeping up my orthodox customs doubled. Five Sri Ramakrishna did not want his young disciples to be stuck in the obsolete customs of an older generation, yet at the same time he did not want to disturb their faith. He did not care for any kind of excessive behavior in practicing religion, he freed them from spiritual vanity. His way of teaching was simple and natural and he knew how to make religion interesting. He taught individually according to the temperament of each disciple. The master was never dry or boring, he would make jokes even while speaking on the most exalted topics. Once, during the chariot festival at Balaram Basu's Calcutta residence, the master told Gangadhar and other young ones, Well, my boys, sing and dance well. Then Balaram will give you Malpo, a delicious sweet dot. He was a loving father to his disciples as well as their friend. Sri Ramakrishna taught from his own experience, not through knowledge acquired from books. Gangadhar later recalled, Once I spent a night at Dakshineswar with several other disciples and the master had us all sit for meditation. While communing with our chosen deities, we often laughed and wept in ecstasy. The pure joy we experienced in those bahud days cannot be expressed in words. Whenever I approached the master, he would invariably ask me, Did you shed tears at the time of prayer or meditation? 
and one day when I answered yes to this, how happy he was. Tears of repentance or sorrow flow from the comers of the eyes nearest the nose, he said, and those of joy from the outer comers of the eyes. Suddenly the master asked me, Do you know how to pray? Saying this he flung his hands and feet about restlessly, like a little child impatient for its mother. Then he cried out, Mother dear, grant me knowledge and devotion. I don't want anything else. I can't live without you. While thus teaching us how to pray, he looked just like a small boy. Profuse tears rolled down his chest and he passed into deep samadhi. I was convinced that the Master did that for my sake. One morning Sri Ramakrishna took me to the Kali temple. Whenever I went there alone, I stood outside the threshold. But on this occasion the Master took me into the sanctum sanctorum and showed me the face of Lord Shiva, who was of course lying on his back while Kali stood over him. His face was not visible from outside the shrine, where one could only see the top of his head. The Master said, Look, here is the living Shiva. I felt that Lord Shiva was conscious and breathing. I was astonished. How potent were the Master's words! Up to that time I had thought that this image was just like all the other Shiva images I had seen. Sri Ramakrishna then gently pulled Mother Kali's cloth and placed her ornaments properly. When we left the temple, he was reeling like a drunkard. He was escorted to his room with difficulty and remained for some time in Samadhi. I cannot describe the details of that day, the joy the Master poured into my heart cannot be communicated. After coming down from Samadhi, the Master sang many songs in an ecstatic mood. Six one day at Balaram's house, Sri Ramakrishna told his would be monastic disciples, I spit upon lust and gold. Those who are attached to them will never have God vision. Seven, he repeated this several times to establish this idea in their minds. Another day in Dakshineswar, a beggar came to the master's door and asked for some money. The master called Gangadhar and, pointing to four pies, asked him to give them to the beggar. When Gangadhar had done this, the master said, Wash your hands with Ganges water, eight this incident indelibly impressed on Gangadhar's mind the idea that money is rubbish, dirt. A true monk should be free from lust and gold. Later in life he wandered fourteen years all over India as a penniless monk, never touching money. Once in Dakshineswar some non-dualistic devotees came from Varanasi to visit the master when Gangadhar was present. He later recorded their conversation in his memoirs. One person asked, Sir, how can he who is the absolute Brahman, omnipresent and pervading the whole universe, incarnate himself as man? You see, the Master replied, He who is the absolute Brahman is the witness and is immanent everywhere. The Divine Incarnation is an embodiment of His power. The power is incarnate somewhere a quarter, somewhere else a half, and very rarely in full. He in whom the full power is manifest is adored as Puma Brahman, like Krishna. And three quarters of the Divine were manifested in Rama. To this, one of the gentlemen said, Sir, this body is the root of all evils. If it can be destroyed, all troubles will cease. The raw earthen pots when broken are made into pots again, the Master said, but the burnt ones, once broken, can never be remade. So if you destroy the body before the attainment of self-realization, you will have to be reborn and suffer similar consequences. But, sir, the gentleman objected, why does one take so much care of his body? The master answered, those who do the work of molding, preserve the mold with care till the image is made. When the image is ready, it does not matter whether the mold is kept or rejected. So with this body, one has to realize the Supreme Self. One has to attain self-knowledge. After that the body may remain or go. 
Till then the body has to be taken care of. The gentleman was silenced. One of these visitors, Gadshankar, was a follower of Keshab Chandra Senator. The master talked with him on the eastern veranda while I was there. Do you practice the Brahminical rites daily? The master asked him. I do not like all these rituals, he said. You see, the master went on. Do not give up anything by force. If the blossoms of gourds and pumpkins are plucked off, their fruits rot, but when the fruits are ripe, the flowers fall off naturally. Do you believe in a God with form or in a formless God? In the formless aspect was the reply. But how can you grasp the formless aspect all at once? The master asked. When the archers are learning to shoot, they first aim at the plantain tree, then at a thin tree, then at a fruit, then at the leaves, and finally at a flying bird. First meditate on the aspect with form. This will enable you to see the formless later. 9. On another occasion, Gangadhar went to Dakshineswar and found that the master was in Samadhi. When he came down to normal consciousness, he spoke of God-vision and Self-realization, saying, One's own chosen deity is one's own self. The chosen deity and the Atman are identical. The vision of the chosen deity is equivalent to self-knowledge. 10. In the middle of 1885, Sri Ramakrishna developed throat cancer. He moved to Shampukur in Calcutta for treatment and then to Kosipore. Gangadhar began to serve the master whenever he could, continuing all the while his spiritual disciplines and study. At night he used to meditate Swami Akhandananda times 565 with Harinath on the bank of the Ganges. Gangadhar's father observed that his son was not interested in completing his education, so he found a job for Gangadhar in a merchant's office. Gangadhar worked there a few days and then gave it up. He then fully engaged himself in spiritual disciplines and service to the master. He washed the dishes at the Kosipore garden house and did all sorts of errands. Even on his deathbed, Sri Ramakrishna took care of his disciples' needs like a loving mother and chastised them for any mistakes. He told them not to misuse any articles or be extravagant because the devotees supported him with their hard-earned money. One morning Gangadhar was in the master's room. The doctor asked the master not to talk because of his painful throat. However, out of motherly affection, the master asked Gangadhar through a gesture, Have you brushed your teeth? Gangadhar nodded his head. On another occasion one of the attendants said, I know. Immediately the master raised his head from the pillow and remarked, What do you say? You know. Never say that. Say, As long as I live so long do I learn. Gangadhar learned a new lesson. Sri Ramakrishna formed his monastic order at Kosipore and distributed ochre cloths to eleven of his would-be monastic disciples, saving one for Girish Chandra Ghosh. He gave ochre cloths to Gangadhar and Harinath on another day. 12. Sri Ramakrishna passed away at 1.02 a.m. on 16th August 1886. Captain Vishwanath Upadhyay came and after examining him, felt some heat in the body. He guessed that the master was in Samadhi. According to his instruction, Gangadhar rubbed ghee, clarified butter, on the master's back the whole night. The master's body was later cremated at the Kosipore cremation ground and half of his relics were installed at Kankurgachi Yogodhyana. Gangadhar was present on that occasion. Wanderings in the Himalayas and Tibet some of the young disciples of Sri Ramakrishna resided at the Kosipore garden house for a couple of weeks and then moved to a dilapidated house at Barnagore, where they established the first Ramakrishna monastery. Shashi began the worship service of the master, while the others remained absorbed in meditation and study. On Christmas Eve of 1886, 
Gangadhar went with the other disciples to Antpur and took vows of renunciation. He returned home and told his father secretly that he would leave for the Himalayas very soon. His father gave his consent. In February 1887, Gangadhar took the ochre cloth that the master had given to him and left the monastery without telling anyone. Only his noble father came to Havda station to see him off. He blessed his son, Go, my son. Fulfill your mission in life. This world is unreal. I bless you. May you attain unflinching devotion to God. 13. Gangadhar first visited Bodh Gaya, where Buddha attained Nirvana. Near the Brahmayuni hill of Gaya, he met the famous yogi Gambhirnath of the Natha sect, who affectionately told him, My boy, stay with me. You will attain everything. Young Gangadhar replied, My master used to say that one cannot have a glimpse of the infinite without seeing the Himalayas or the ocean. So I am eager to see the Himalayas. While at Gaya, he stayed at the house of Durgashankar, a devotee of Sri Ramakrishna. One day Durgashankar said to him, I talked to you such a long tin and I noticed your eyes never blinked. It is a sign of a divine nature. You are truly a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, 14 Pramdadas Mitra, a rich landlord as well as a great Sanskrit scholar, met Gangadhar at Durgashankar's house in Gaya. He had heard about Sri Ramakrishna from his friend Durgashankar, and now he was impressed upon seeing the young yogi Gangadhar. Pramdadas invited Gangadhar to his home in Varanasi. There he taught Gangadhar how to correctly chant the Upanishads and Sanskrit hymns in a melodious way. Gangadhar had a wonderful memory and learned Vedic chanting after hearing it only once. While in Varanasi, Gangadhar met the great Saint Trilangaswami and received his blessing. He then went to see Swami Bhaskarananda with Pramdadas, who knew the great Swami personally. Bhaskarananda was a great Sanskrit scholar and he expressed his willingness to teach the Vedas to Gangadhar. The young man replied, The power of sight which I would use for attaining knowledge by reading books, please turn it inward, so that I can experience the Atman. Bhaskarananda marveled at him and remarked, I see you are a yogi, 15 one can learn more from a saint than from a library of a million books. Gangadhar absorbed the spiritual heritage of India from her holy places and saints. After staying a month in Varanasi, Gangadhar left for Ayodhya, the birthplace of Ramchandra. There he met Janki Brasharan, an all-renouncing mystic. He then went to Hardwar, in the foothills of the Himalayas, via Lucknow and Namishranya, an ancient Hindu cultural centre. In March 1887, Gangadhar wrote to Pramdadas asking him to send a drum to Barnagore Monastery for the monks' Vesper services. Thus he first introduced this great person to Swami Vivekananda and other disciples of the Master. Early one morning in Hardwar, Gangadhar climbed up the Chandi hill and there met Kamraj, a Tantric saint. Kamraj was impressed with Gangadhar and asked him, what do you want? He replied, I want that experience which is mentioned in the Gita attaining that one grieves not and desires not. 12.17 Oh, you want self-knowledge, said the saint. You don't want my divine mother. 16. The saint's passionate love for mother touched Gangadhar's heart. Gangadhar then went to Rishikesh, a place for the hermits. There he saw mendicants practicing their austerities, meditating and discussing the Upanishads and the Gita. He found a thatched hut on the bank of the Ganges, where he practiced meditation. Once a day, the manager of the Chathra, a resting place for monks and pilgrims, where monks are giver, free meals, would ring a bell to call the mendicants there for food. Some days Gangadhar was so absorbed in meditation that he did not hear the bell. He would then beg food from villagers in the afternoon. 
at that time Rishikesh was dangerously infested with wild animals. Gangadhar heard from the mendicants that a few days earlier a tiger had grabbed a Vedanta monk and he had repeated loudly, Soham I am he, until he died. It is thrilling to read Gangadhar's entire travel account, which he recorded in his book Smritikatha, From Holy Wanderings to the Service of God in Man. He travelled hundreds of miles in the dangerous mountains of the Himalayas without carrying any money or any extra clothing, depending only on God. When a monk of the Masuri hills heard that Gangadhar was going to Gangotri and Jamunotri, the sources of the Ganges and Jamuna, respectively, he offered some money and blankets to him, but he refused. Gangadhar accepted only a staff and proceeded on his journey. Gangadhar walked sixty miles barefoot to reach Tihiri, where he rested a while. He then continued his long walk over the high Himalayan range and visited Jamunotri and Gangotri, very important holy places and most difficult to reach. The spirit of service was ingrained in Gangadhar's nature. While on the way to Jamunotri, he came across a sick monk. With another person's help, he carried the monk to the nearest village but could not save his life. Another time, in a cave at Gangotri he found a Brahman who had been starving for two days while fulfilling a vow to continually recite the Gayatri Mantram. Gangadhar immediately begged food from some pilgrims and gave it to the Brahman. Gangadhar stayed at Gangotri for a week, then decided to visit Kedarnath and Badrinath. He took the route via Chandravdani, a famous place sacred to the Divine Mother. While descending the steep Chandravdani hill, Gangadhar lost his way. He closed his eyes and sat for meditation in that dense forest. He later wrote, I got up and saying victory to the master, I moved forward without caring for direction. It was almost impossible to stop my motion down the steep hill. I grabbed hold of shrubs and trees. My feet slipped and at last I tumbled down into a cornfield. Two hill men were roasting sheaves of wheat for food. Seeing me, they were taken aback and said, How is it possible? Where did you come from? Who led you here? No human being has ever come down this way. On hearing that I had come from the temple of Goddess Chandravdani, they said, The mother must have held you by the hand and brought you here. I had actually felt that someone led me there by the hand. I had slipped down as much as two miles. Seventeen Gangadhar wholeheartedly depended on Ramakrishna and sometimes he would follow a dangerous route in the Himalayas in order to test whether the master was with him or not. One day, some woodcutters stopped him from continuing his journey because there was a bear on his path. At one time, Gangadhar said, In a Himalayan village I took shelter in a house and spent the first part of the night along with others and their cattle. But at midnight a tiger roared, and they were shivering out of fear. I silently got up and thought, What? I am a monk. Am I afraid of death? I left the house and spent the rest of the night in meditation under a tree. 18. Today it is relatively easy to travel to Kedarnath and Badrinath by car from Hardwar, but when Gangadhar was a young man it was extremely difficult and indeed dangerous to visit those inaccessible places. To the Hindus, the Himalayas are the abode of God and Vedanta mystics. Mystics love to stay away from people and remain in solitude absorbed in the contemplation of God. The vast mountain range of the Himalayas reminded Gangadhar of the cosmic god Shiva and his wife Parvati, the daughter of the Himalayas. Gangadhar later recalled, When I first saw the entirely snow-clad, huge and bright peak on which the temple of Kedarnath is situated, I was stupefied. The temple of Kedarnath was on the lap of a huge peak and the entire peak was now revealing itself before me. It was as bright as the glowing morning sun. Thousands of soft rays were emerging from the peak 
and they were all enveloping and overwhelming me. I thought to myself that I had come to this place of eternal light leaving the eternal darkness permanently behind. I could not look at the snow-white peak for long. My eyes became indrawn and the huge peak of the mountain appeared before me as an eternal, uncreated symbol of Shiva. This was not imagination. It was a divine experience. Nowhere else in the entire Himalayas can you see such a resplendent form of Shiva. 19 From Kedarnath, Gangadhar went to Badrinath, a place sacred to Lord Vishnu, where sage Vyasa compiled the Vedas and wrote the Puranas, and Shankara wrote his commentaries on the Upanishads, Brahma Sutras, and the Gita. It is a wonderful place to practice austerities. Gangadhar stayed in Thap spiritual place for some days, and then decided to venture to Tibet via the Manapas. Shar Singh, the head of the Mana village, warned him that the journey was dangerous. Many people had died along the way. Before Gangadhar left, however, an official of the Thuling Buddhist monastery of Tibet came to Mana to do some trading, and Gangadhar became acquainted with him. Gangadhar started for Tibet with a trader, but part way into the journey, the trader pointed in the direction of the Thuling monastery and went his own way. It was an arduous journey, and before he could reach the monastery Gangadhar fell unconscious on the ice. The next morning a monk happened to find him and carried him to the monastery. The lamas warmed him, thus saving his life. They discovered in Gangadhar the signs of a monk with unbroken chastity. When they saw the picture of Sri Ramakrishna that he carried with him, one lama asked, Who is he? These eyes do not belong to an ordinary human being. This person must be a Buddha. Twenty Gangadhar learned the Tibetan language in fifteen days and stayed there for three months. Observing the lama's luxury, their love of money, food and dress, he spoke to them on behalf of the poor. Because of this, the lamas kept him captive in the monastery and tortured him. One lama hit him on his shoulder with a sword in its scabbard. The poor people loved him, and once several of them told the lamas of his sympathy for them. Gangadhar was summoned again. This time the lamas said that they would cut open his jaw or keep him in lifelong imprisonment if he persisted in speaking out for the peasants. But with the help of some friendly traders, Gangadhar ran away. He returned to Badrinath via the Niti Pass. 21 The next year Gangadhar again went to Tibet, this time to Daba. While going to Lhasa he was arrested. His trader friends had him released. Gangadhar then visited Mount Kailas and Manas Sarovar. The snow-clad Kailas is like a natural image of the Lord Shiva, and Manas Sarovar is a large lake with a 50-mile circumference. There are eight Buddhist monasteries around the lake. A Buddhist monk taught Gangadhar a posture that helps to preserve body heat. When Gangadhar asked, What am I supposed to do sitting in this way? The monk replied, Do nothing, just empty the mind. 22. On the way to Kilas, Gangadhar was attacked by robbers, he saved his life by giving them fried rice and molasses. On his way back he stopped at the Chekra village and became the guest of a rich gypsy. One day his host saw the picture of Ramakrishna next to Gangadhar's bed. As soon as he touched it, he lost outer consciousness. He asked Gangadhar, where did you get this picture? Please give it to me. One shall worship him every day. He is the veritable Buddha. Otherwise, why did I become overwhelmed upon touching his picture? An ordinary human being cannot have such a facial expression. 23 Gangadhar again returned to Badrinath via the Niti Pass. In July 1889, Gangadhar went to Tibet a third time. He planned to go to Lhasa, but many of the Tibetans objected to his going, suspecting him of being a British spy. His former friends, too, felt differently, 
and advised him to leave Tibet as soon as possible. He made three determined efforts to reach Lhasa but failed. Gangadhar returned to Kashmir via Ladakh, where he was arrested by the British government. He was released when it was confirmed that he was a monk and had no political motive. As he was quite familiar with the Tibetan people, language, customs and religious culture, the British government offered him a consul's post in Tibet, but he refused. 24 with Swami Vivekananda in June of 1890, after being away for three and a half years, Gangadhar returned to the Barnagore Monastery. Vivekananda and the other brother disciples were extremely happy to have him back and to hear of his adventurous travel. Swamiji affectionately called him Ganges, as his name was Gangadhar, and sometimes Ice Father, as his skin had been burned with cold. In the first week of July, Swamiji advised Gangadhar to take final monastic woes before Sri Ramakrishna's picture, in accordance with the Vedantic tradition. Gangadhar then became Swami Akhandananda, which means undivided bliss. Swamiji now wanted to practice austerities in the Himalayas, so in mid-July he left the monastery, taking Akhandananda as his companion. Before their departure, they went to Holy Mother for her blessing. She blessed them and told Akhandananda, My son, you know the way of life in the mountains. Please take care of Nargan, so that he may not suffer from lack of food. 25 They first travelled to Bhagalpur, then to Bajanath, Gazipur and Varanasi, where they became guests of Pramdadas Mitra. Afterwards they visited Ayodhya and then proceeded to Nanital in the Himalayas. One day Akhandananda bathed in the ice-cold water of a lake and as a result he caught a severe cold accompanied by chest pain. From Nanital they went to Almora, where they joined Swami Sardananda and Vakuntha Nath Sanyal. They planned to settle on the bank of the Ganges with the intention of practicing sadhana. Unfortunately, however, Akhandananda was attacked by fever at Karnaprayad and Swamiji became sick as well. At Srinagar, a doctor examined Akhandananda, diagnosed bronchitis, and advised him to go to the warm climate of the plains as early as possible. The party moved to Dehradun and were joined there by Swami Turiyananda. After arranging for Akhandananda's medical treatment, Swamiji and the others left for Rishikesh to practice spiritual disciplines. In late 1890, when Akhandananda had slightly improved, it was suggested that he go to Merit for further treatment. Swamiji had also become very sick in Rishikesh. He and others joined Akhandananda in Merit, where they became the guests of Dr. Tralukya Nath Ghosh. Swamis Brahmananda and Advaitananda also joined them, and Merit thus became a second Barnagore monastery. They lived there for nearly six weeks. While there, Akhandananda would bring books from the Merit library for Swamiji, and he himself would also study. In the early part of 1891, Swamiji departed alone as an itinerant monk and the other brothers went off in different directions in northern and western India. Akhandananda went to Delhi. While sitting on a park bench one day, he thought, If I meet a devotee of the Master, I shall go to his house, otherwise I shall pass the night here. A Marwadi gentleman was seated on the other side of the bench. Out of respect for a monk, he saluted Akhandananda and offered him some money, but Akhandananda would not touch it. Then the Marwadi exclaimed, I have seen only one great soul, Ramakrishna Parmahamsa of Dakshineswar, who completely renounced money. When Akhandananda inquired, he said that he was Lakshminarayan Marwadi. He had once offered 10,000 rupees to Sri Ramakrishna, but the master had refused to accept it. Akhandananda was very happy to meet another devotee of the master and introduced himself to him. 
Then Lakshminarayan joyfully took the Swami to his house. 26572 times God lived with them. Akhandananda stopped at Agra on his way to Vrindavan, the playground of Krishna. At Agra he met a Sufi who knew the Koran by heart. Akhandananda asked him, What have you achieved from your lifelong sadhana? The Sufi replied, If you put a lemon in salt, it becomes saturated with salt, likewise I am saturated in God. This I have realized. 27. In March 1891, Akhandananda arrived at Vrindavan and stayed for nearly four months. While at Vrindavan, he had a relapse of bronchitis. In May he moved to Itava accompanied by Swami Nirmalananda. In Itava, he studied Sanskrit grammar and Shridhra's commentary on the Gita. On the birthday of Krishna, Akhandananda had the vision of the Master standing near his head, saying, Hello! Do the people know that I came? This vision made his heart full of joy. 28 He then learned from a letter that Swamiji was in Jaipur, so he wanted to see him again. Akhandananda went to Ajmere and there met Mr. Williams, a Christian devotee of the Master. Akhandananda wrote, He considered Sri Ramakrishna an incarnation of Christ. He told me about his meeting with the Master. During my first visit with him, the Master spread a mat for me and another for himself. He said, Look here, the two mats are an inch apart. Two mats may be apart, I said, but there is no distance between our hearts 29. The Master instructed Mr. Williams at that time. He later went to the Himalayas to practice sadhana and there he passed away. After visiting Abu, Ahmedabad, Baroda, Narmada, Junagadh, Prabhas, Dwarka and Kachamandavi, Akhandananda started on another journey. He walked 80 miles to see Narayan Sarovar, a holy lake in Gujarat. He was cautioned by the local people that the path was dangerous and haunted by robbers, but Akhandananda prepared himself to face them. He took a young boy as his guide and learned from him the words in Kutch dialect, take everything I have, but don't kill me. He had covered 50 miles when he met a pilgrim on the way and then let the boy continue his own journey. That part of the country was severely affected by famine and sparsely populated. In the afternoon Akhandananda noticed that four men wearing red turbans were following them diagonally. As the pilgrim was an elderly man, he remained a little behind the Swami. When the men who had been following them approached Akhandananda, he asked, How far is it to Narayan Sarovar? Six miles, one of them answered. Then all of a sudden, one of them grabbed his shoulder and thrust him onto the ground. Immediately, the Swami said in their language, Take everything I have, but don't kill me. Another robber then struck his back twice with a bamboo staff. Luckily, his cotton shirt and backpack cushioned the Swami Akhandananda times 573 blows. Two robbers with daggers in their hands ordered Akhandananda to remove his clothes. He kept on his coffin, lawn cloth, and handed everything else over to them. They searched his clothing and bundle, but found no money. They then realized that the Swami was a genuine, penniless monk. In the meantime, the pilgrim arrived. Upon seeing the robbers, he fell to the ground, saying, I am gone. Akhandananda asked the robbers not to hurt the old pilgrim. Knowing that they were poor, the Swami offered his warm clothing to the robbers. The ringleader was very touched. He took the dust of the Swami's feet and begged for his blessings. He then asked Akhandananda not to tell anyone about this episode and then all of them disappeared swiftly. 30 That evening Akhandananda reached Narayan Sarovar and became the guest at the local monastery. The Swami had a high temperature and his body ached terribly. As a result, he could not bathe in the sacred lake. The abbot gave Akhandananda a horse and a guide to accompany him on his journey and at last he met Swamiji at Mandavi. 
Although Swamiji wanted to travel alone, they travelled together for a while in Bhuj and Purbandar. Then Swamiji left for Junagadh and Akhandananda moved towards Jamnagar via Kathiawar, Jeetpur, Gondal and Rajkot. In June 1892, Akhandananda reached Jamnagar, where he lived for a year. There he started his mission, the service of God in man. He lived with a doctor, Kaviraj Manishankar, for four months and studied Charak Sushruta Sanhita, Ayurvedic medical science. He also went to a Vedic school and learned to chant the four Vedas. He became acquainted with an old abbot of an affluent temple, who offered the Swami his position as well as all of his wealth. Akhandananda declined, quoting a Hindi couplet. The water is pure that flows, and the monk is pure who goes. 31 Akhandananda then moved to the house of a banker by the name of Shankar Set. He lived with him for four months. Shankar Set was a devout and wealthy man and had no children. Every day he performed worship, practiced japam and meditation, and distributed food to the poor and mendicants. He became very fond of the Swami and would give to charities according to his advice. When Akhandananda wanted to leave, Shankar asked him to stay and even offered to build a Ramakrishna temple on his land. This was unbearable for Shankar's nephews who were supposed to inherit their uncle's property. They tried to kill Akhandananda by poisoning his coffee. As a result, the Swami suffered from terrible diarrhea and remained in bed for four days, gravely ill. Eventually, Kaviraj Jandubhat, a local doctor, managed to save his life. 574 times God lived with them Akhandahenda then went to Jandubhat's house. Dr. Bhatt was a remarkable physician and a highly spiritual person. He was 70, yet extremely energetic for his age. He would give free medicine to the poor and would even visit them in their homes. He frequently recited the following two verses, which express his life's philosophy, O Lord, I do not want any kingdom, nor heavenly pleasure, nor even escape from rebirth. But I do want the affliction of all beings tormented by the miseries of life to cease. O Lord, is there any way whereby I may enter in for the hearts of all beings and always share the burden of their sufferings? Thirty to these verses touched Akhandananda's heart, and he came to realize that the highest ideal is to love and serve other human beings. Of course, Akhandananda had always been a loving and caring person, but in Jamnagar, Dr. Bhatt roused his dormant inner feeling. Akhandananda then went to Khetri in Rajasthan via Baroda, Bhavnagar, where he learned of Swamiji's success in America, Bombay, and Abu, where he became the guest of Raja Ajit Singh, Vivekananda's disciple. Akhandananda lived in Rajasthan for nearly eight months. He observed the pitiful condition of the masses as well as the luxury of a handful of rulers and rich landlords. His heart melted for the downtrodden and he drew his concerns to the local rulers' attention, asking them to ameliorate the poor condition of the masses. He wrote a letter to Swamiji in America, asking him for guidance. Swamiji replied in early 1894, Go from door to door amongst the poor and lower classes of the town of Khetri and teach them religion. Also, let them have oral lessons on geography and such other subjects. No good will come of sitting idle and having princely dishes and saying Ramakrishna, O Lord, unless you can do some good to the poor. It is preferable to live on grass for the sake of doing good to others. The ochre robe is not for enjoyment. It is the banner of heroic work. The poor, the illiterate, the ignorant, the afflicted, by his strenuous efforts, he succeeded in raising the enrollment of the local high school from 80 to 257, as well as improving the teaching staff. He next visited the villages around Khetri, and started five primary schools for the Swami Akhandananda times 575 village boys. 
The Maharaja of Khetri afterwards made an annual grant of 5,000 rupees for the promotion of education in his territory. At Akhandananda's request, the Sanskrit school at Khetri was converted into a Vedic school. He also raised money to buy books for the poor students. In addition, he induced Maharaja Ajit Singh to allow his poorer subjects to see him on Darbar, official reception, days, so that they could have direct access to their king. People listen to the advice of the person who harbors no ill feelings and has no ulterior motives. Akhandananda was so bold that he did not hesitate to correct even the habits of kings. He later reminisced, the Maharaja of Khetri would rise late. One day I told him that those who eat too much and rise late can never attain prosperity. From then on the Maharaja would rise early, even earlier than 1.1 would get up and find him standing and smiling at me. Some days he would be walking on the roof, and some days I would find him reading in the library with the help of a light. 34. After his stay in Khetri, Akhandananda visited Jaipur, Chittor, Udaipur, and many other villages of Rajasthan. He asked the local rulers to start schools, distribute food among the poor, and support cottage industries. Some rich landlords would lend money to the farmers and then demand high interest. They did not like the Swami's revolutionary ideas. Even the king of Udaipur became upset when Akhandananda refused to take food from the royal priest unless the poor people were fed first. Some of these enraged people threatened his life. Akhandananda was undaunted, however, and continued his mission. He succeeded in starting several schools and performing other philanthropic activities in Rajasthan. Akhandananda had wanted to lead an austere and contemplative life, but divine providence ordained that under his monastic garb, he would instead become a patriot, statesman and philanthropist. In September 1894, Swamiji wrote to his Madrasi disciples from America regarding the pioneering spirit of Sri Ramakrishna's disciples. He remarked, mentioning Akhandananda, Look at the handful of young men called into existence by the divine touch of Sri Ramakrishna's feet. They have preached the message from Assam to Sindh, from the Himalayas to Cape Kamarin. They have crossed the Himalayas at a height of 20,000 feet, over snow and ice on foot, and penetrated into the mysteries of Tibet. They have begged their bread, covered themselves with rags, they have been persecuted, followed by the police, kept in prison, and at last set free when the government was convinced of their innocence. They are now twenty. Make them two thousand tomorrow, thirty-five back to Alambazar Monastery towards the end of 1895 Akhandananda returned to the De Alambazar Monastery via Delhi, Itawa, Allahabad, and Varanasi. In 1892, the Ramakrishna math had been moved from Barnagore to Alambazar, which is very close to Dakshineswar. It was a haunted house like Barnagore, therefore the rent was only 10 rupees per month. The brother disciples were happy to have Akhandananda with them again after five years. The monastery was in poor financial condition. Akhandananda later recalled, in the monastery we ate rice, lentils, and a hotchpotch vegetable curry. At night we ate chapati, flattened bread, without butter, 36, but because their minds were filled with divine bliss, the hardship did not disturb them. Monastic indolence is terrible, and Akhandananda was a man of action. He could not tolerate a monk who forgot his ideal, indulging in eating, sleeping, and gossiping. Akhandananda had so much energy and so much love for the master that he travelled for nearly three weeks in remote villages to collect Nageshwar Champa, a favourite flower of Sri Ramakrishna. During this trip he taught the villagers sanitation, health care and so on. Akhandananda's gigantic heart cried for the poor, the destitute and the sick. One day, 
When he was on his way to bathe in the Ganges, he found an old woman suffering from cholera. He cleaned her unconscious body, changed her clothing, and then sent her to the hospital. In March 1896, the annual Ramakrishna festival was held at the Dakshineswar Temple Garden, and the devotees planned two kinds of prasad, one for the poor and another for themselves. Akhandananda had a democratic attitude and could not bear such an inequitable arrangement. He complained about this to Swami Brahmananda, who then ordered that one kind of prasad be prepared for everybody. Akhandananda was a great organizer. While in Bengal, he met many pandits, educators and political leaders and consulted with them about starting a Vedic school. In 1897, when Swami Vivekananda returned from the West, Akhandananda worked hard to arrange a reception for him. He went to Satish Giri, the abbot of the Tarkeshwar Monastery, and asked him to join Swamiji's reception, but he declined because Vivekananda was not a Brahman. When Akhandananda reminded him that Swamiji had been welcomed by the Shankaracharya of Shringeri Math and other religious orders of South India, Satish Giri apologized and explained to the Swami that he had no time as he was occupied with other affairs. Swami Akhandananda times 577 in Alambajar, Akhandananda suffered from malaria. One day while he was sick, he had a spiritual experience. Before this, he had felt that the non-dualistic experience, I am the Atman, is greater than the five kinds of dualistic relationships with God. While Akhandananda lay ill, however, he had the following vision, he saw the luminous form of baby Krishna in his room and Krishna's mother, Yashoda, appeared from Akhandananda's own body. The baby was begging for food, so Yashoda began to sing and play with her little darling in order to pacify him. Sri Ramakrishna then appeared and said, Look, what a wonderful scene! Akhandananda joyfully exclaimed, I don't care for Nirvana, Master. This is wonderful. I don't care if I am born hundreds of times in my present state of mind. 37 After that experience, Akhandananda became imbued with the idea of being the mother with all beings as his children. He recorded in his memoirs. One sultry day some brothers were asleep in the front room of the monastery. I couldn't sleep because of the heat. Others were perspiring and their sheets were wet. I got up and began to fan them with great joy. Their perspiration dried and they slept peacefully. But what a wonder! My body also became cooled within half an hour. I was thrilled to realize that I had developed the capacity to feel others' happiness and misery. 38. In Murshidabad, in March 1897, Vivekananda went to Darjeeling for rest, and Akhandananda left for Navadweep, the birthplace of Chaitanya and Murshidabad, an important historical site. He was thinking of returning to the Himalayas for the remainder of his days after seeing some of the notable places in Bengal. In Murshidabad district, however, the Swami encountered a terrible famine. He saw death and dying everywhere. In the villages, he saw emaciated cattle and their herdsmen. At night he slept in a shop at Dadpur village, which belonged to the local ruler. Akhandananda reminisced, Early one morning I washed my hands and feet in the Ganges and was approaching the bazaar when I discovered a Muslim girl of about fourteen, clad in dirty rags, weeping bitterly. She held at her waist an earthen pitcher, the bottom of which had given way. When the Swami inquired the cause of her grief, she said, Father, there is famine and we have nothing at home to eat. At home we have only this pitcher for carrying water and two earthen cooking pots. There is no second vessel to carry water. My mother will beat me, so I am crying out of fear. 39. 37. Akhandananda happened to have four annas in his pocket. 
He took the girl to a shop and bought a pitcher for her as well as some puffed rice. Before he got his balance of three annas from the shopkeeper, he was encircled by a dozen children crying for food. He bought more puffed rice with the remaining corns and distributed it among the hungry children. At night he decided to leave that place as soon as possible because he felt completely helpless and unable to relieve the poor. As he was leaving the village in the morning, a middle-aged woman approached him, saying, Father, Gaya Vaishnavi, an old woman, is dying. Please do something for her. The Swami expressed his inability to do anything, but later relented at her insistence. He went to see this old woman, who was suffering from diarrhea and covered in filth. To save her life, the Swami rushed to Jeevan Krishna Das, the landlord of the village, and arranged daily food for her. He even begged a piece of cloth from a clerk for that woman. The old woman expressed her gratitude with tearful eyes, Father, you must have been my son in my previous life, Forty Akhandananda replied, Why your previous life? I am your son in this life. Akhandananda then started towards Bahrampur, the district town of Murshidabad. He stopped for one night at Bhapta village. In the morning, when he was about to leave, he heard a voice say, Where will you go? You have many things to do here. 41 He heard the voice thrice, so did not proceed further. A teacher of the Bhapta school invited the Swami to attend the Annapurna, the goddess of food, worship in Mahula, an adjacent village. While there, he fervently prayed to the mother to save the lives of the poor people. Akhandananda was then offered a room in the temple complex and thought deeply about his future plans. He began giving classes on the Gita to the villagers and they fed him. One day Akhandananda was invited by a Brahman for lunch, but in the morning when he learned that Farmer 7's family had been starving for two days, he began to cry to the master, closing the door of his room. The host waited outside for a long time. At last the Swami came out and said that he would accept his food provided he would send some food to this poor family. The host then agreed. Akhandananda later wrote, I carried a picture of Sri Ramakrishna with me. Every day after my bath in the Ganges, I would offer some flowers before it and pray to the Master with tears for the famine-stricken people. Thus I prayed every morning and evening. One day there was a response. I heard the Master's voice say, Wait and see what happens. 42 On 15th May 1897, Akhandananda started farm and relief work in Mahula and several other villages in the Murshidabad district. It was the first organized relief work of the Ramakrishna mission, which had been started by Swami Vivekananda on 1st May 1897 in Calcutta. Akhandananda wrote letters to his brother disciples in Calcutta and Madras requesting financial help. He wrote in detail about the tragic scenes of the dying people. The response was immediate, Swamiji sent to monks to help him. Seeing the appeal for relief in the newspapers, the Mahabodhi Society and some generous people of Madras and Calcutta sent money to him. Mr. E. V. Levinge, the district magistrate, and Mr. Panton, the district judge, also came forward to assist in Akhandananda's relief operation. On 15th June 1897, Vivekananda wrote to him from Almora, I am get 17 detailed reports of you and getting more and more delighted. It is that sort of work which can conquer the world. Work, 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 even unto death. Those that are weak must make themselves great workers, great heroes, never mind money, it will drop from the heavens. It is the heart, the heart that conquers, not the brain. Books and learning, yoga and meditation, and illumination, all are but dust compared with love. It is love that gives you the supernatural powers, love that gives you bhakti, devotion, 
love that gives illumination and love, again, that leads to emancipation. This indeed is worship, worship of the Lord in the human tabernacle. 43 Swamiji's letter increased Akhandananda's spirit of service a thousandfold. He later reminisced, I read his letters over and over again and gained fresh strength within me. Mantram Vasadhyayam Shariram Vapatayam I shall either carry out my purpose or lay down my body, this mantram filled my heart. Oh, into what a current of activity did I then submerge myself? 44 Akhandananda's activities were so vast and far-ranging that it is almost impossible to record all of them. One day there was an earthquake, which was soon followed by an outbreak of cholera. The more providence tested him, the more he continued his relief work. Akhandananda eventually opened an orphanage and started a school for the children. He nursed the sick and taught the villagers the basics of hygiene. He also continued his preaching and distributed the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna among the villagers at Shivnagar and Sargachi. When the relief operation in Mahula was over, Akhandananda decided to open a permanent orphanage. The Murshidabad district magistrate promised to give him financial help for this project. Madhusundari Burman, a rich landowner, was impressed with Akhandananda's work, so she donated one and a half acres of land to him for the ashrama and offered him her office building in Shivnagar, near Sargachi, to use temporarily. Sargachi village is situated on Krishnangar Road, six miles south of Bahrampur. In 1898, the Ramakrishna Monastery had been moved from Alambazar to Nilambar Babu's garden house at Belur. On Tuesday, 22nd February 1898, Akhandananda arrived there to attend the festival of Sri Ramakrishna's birth anniversary. He carried from Bahrampur to Pantuas, a sweet made of cheese fried with butter and soaked in syrup, which weighed 64 pounds and had been presented by a rich devotee. Swamiji saw those large sweets and asked him to offer them to the master in the shrine. Vivekananda then told a disciple, Look, what a great hero he, Akhandananda, is in work. He is unaware of fear and death and doggedly does his work for the good of many and the welfare of all. The disciple commented, Sir, that power must have come to him as a result of great austerities. Swamiji replied, It is true, power comes through practicing austerities, again, working for others is also austerity. The karma yogis consider work itself as a part of austerity. As on the one hand, the practice of austerity intensifies altruistic feelings in an aspirant and actuates him to unselfish work, so also the pursuit of work for the sake of others purifies one's heart, and that leads him to the realization of the Supreme Atman. 45. It is worth mentioning how the disciples of the Master lived together in the monastery with much joy and amusement. Akhandananda later narrated this particular incident, one day in Belur, Swamiji was telling the stories of his itinerant days and I was supplying the forgotten events to him. He scolded me, don't talk too much. Keep quiet and meditate. So I obeyed him. In the meantime, he talked about a fish in the Himalayas and asked me, Hello, how big was that fish? With my eyes closed, I raised my two hands and showed the size of that fish. All burst into laughter, 46 Akhandananda also told another story that illustrates how strict Swamiji was about the monastery routine. One night there was a discussion on various topics of Vedanta, such as reincarnation and whether a human soul is born in the subhuman plane or not. The brothers took sides in the debate and Swamiji became the umpire. He was smiling and listening, and sometimes, he supplied points to the losing side. It continued till 2 a.m. Everybody went to sleep. But then at 4 a.m., 
Swamiji asked me to ring the bell so that the monks could go to the shrine for meditation. I said that they had gone to sleep only a couple of hours earlier, Swami Akhandananda times 581, and that he should let them sleep a little more. Swamiji then firmly said, What? Because they have gone to sleep at 2 o'clock should they get up at 6 o'clock. Give me the bell. I will ring it. Did we start this monastery for sleeping? When I rang the bell loudly, all got up yelling at me. But when they saw Swamiji smiling behind me, they silently followed the routine. 47 After working hard for a year, Akhandananda fell sick at the Belur Monastery. On 30th March 1898, after he had recovered, he went with Swamiji to Darjeeling for a change. While they were gone, a plague broke out in Calcutta. In the first week of May, Swamiji and Akhandananda returned to Calcutta. There was terrible panic and chaos in Calcutta. In an attempt to comfort the people and plague victims, Swamiji wrote a pamphlet, Akhandananda distributed copies at the risk of his life. Sister Nivedita, Swamiji's Irish disciple, and Swami Sadananda also did extensive relief work in Calcutta. When the epidemic subsided, Swamiji left for Almora and Akhandananda returned to Sargachi. The doers of good always encounter obstacles, but God gives them patience, perseverance and strength. The more the cunent of a river is obstructed, the more vigorously it flows. Some selfish, rich people of Sargachi village could not bear Akhandananda's popularity. They put pressure on him to leave the place, they wrote adversely to Vivekananda about him, they even brought a legal suit against him. Swamiji said to him, Don't be upset listening to public criticism. 48 It is said, criticisms are like ornaments to a pioneer. Akhandananda faced terrible poverty in Sargachi. He wrote letters to some of his old acquaintances asking for financial help. Pramdada Smitra of Varanasi wrote back to him mentioning that it is better for a monk to travel, study and practice meditation and japam than to get involved in social service. On 19th October 1898, Akhandananda replied, I am delighted that you have reminded me about my olden days. Those days are gone, and now a new era has sprung up. The Atman never changes, but life changes. Now I don't enjoy travelling anymore. When I first went to the Himalayas, I was a different person. Now I wonder upon seeing myself. At that time I would avoid seeing human beings and leaving the village, I loved to live in the secluded caves of the Himalayas surrounded by ferocious animals. In this way I lived for some years. Now I see God living in all human beings and I have realized that service to man is service to God. God, as it were, is whispering in my ears, Verily these human beings are the Vedic sages, they are divine incarnations like Rama and Krishna, they are everything, 49 where sincerity, unselfishness and love exist, God sends help. A few large-hearted local people, including some European officials, some silk merchants and Maharaja Manindra Chandra Nandi of Kashimbazar came forward to help Akhandananda build a permanent ashrama and orphanage. Akhandananda was a silent and unpretentious worker, so without caring for the city 7's fanfare, he continued to worship his living gods in the remote village. Putting aside the monastic ochre cloth, he put on knee-length pants and tied his head with a handkerchief and tilled the ground like other farmers. He lived on a farmer's diet, mixing lime and salt with rice soaked in water. He grew fruits, flowers, vegetables and even cotton. Like Gandhi, he started to weave cloth on a spinning wheel. He arranged regular, practical schooling for his orphan boys and at night he taught the illiterate adult villagers. He gave medicine to the sick people. When one of his orphans died, 
He cried like a loving mother who had lost her son. The Passing Events In October 1899, Akhandananda was invited by Raja Yogendra Narayan, the ruler of Lalgola, to attend Durga Puja in his palace and also to distribute 15,000 pieces of cloth among the poor. On the second day of Mother's worship, Akhandananda learned of a devastating flood in the Bhagalpur district of Bihar. He immediately left for Bhagalpur, reaching it the next day. He was impressed by the relief work of Mr. Kaming, the district magistrate of Bhagalpur. Mr. Kaming asked Akhandananda to conduct relief work in the Ghogha area. The Swami organized the local landlords, lawyers, teachers and students to face the catastrophe. Swami Sadananda was sent from Belur Math and the public generously helped the effort with money, food and clothing. Akhandananda operated the relief work for two and a half months, serving fifty villages. Akhandananda wrote to Swamiji, who was then in America, mentioning the relief work. On 21st February 1900, Swamiji replied from California. I am very glad to receive your letter and go.th rough the details of news. Learning and wisdom are superfluities, the surface glitter merely, but it is the heart that is the seat of all power. It is not in the brain but in the heart that the Atman, possessed of knowledge, power and activity, has its seat. The nerves of the heart are a hundred and one. The chief nerve, center near the heart, called the sympathetic ganglia, is where the Atman has its citadel. The more heart you will be able to manifest, the greater will be the victory you achieve. 50 Vivekananda returned to India in December 1900. He passed away a year and a half later, on 4th July 1902. When Akhandananda heard the news, he rushed to Belur Man. He cried for Swamiji and lived in the monastery with his brother disciples for a few days. He was depressed and felt emptiness all around. On the seventh day after Swamiji's passing, he went to Calcutta to meet Sharat Chandra Chakrabarti, a disciple of Swamiji. Later, Akhandananda told Miss Josephine MacLeod, an American devotee, I have seen Swamiji after his passing away as clearly as I see you now, otherwise I could not live. Separation was so painful. I was going to commit suicide but was prevented by Swamiji. He caught my hand when I was about to jay ump under the running tram, 51 this vision filled his heart with joy and inspiration. Akhandananda returned to his ashrama. He managed the orphanage and the ashrama activities from the Shivnagar office building for over 12 years. The land that had been donated was not sufficient for the ashrama, so in August 1912 he bought about 13 acres of land in Sargachi village. According to the Swami's plan, some rooms were constructed with thatched roofs in order to save money, and then in March 1913 the ashrama was permanently moved to the new location. Akhandananda planted flowering plants and fruit trees all around and made the ashrama like an ancient hermitage. Along with education, the Swami concentrated on improving the agricultural and industrial activities amongst the villagers. The ashrama ran a full-fledged industrial school, teaching weaving, sewing, carpentry, and sericulture, which was the pride of the locality. One room of the ashrama was allotted for a library and charitable dispensary and another room for the shrine. In the beginning he was not in favor of building a temple, as he was convinced that he was worshipping the living gods. Later, however, at his devotee's request he gave consent to build a temple for Sri Ramakrishna. Akhandananda was a self-made man. He was a voracious reader, a linguist, a powerful speaker, a humorous conversationalist and a good writer. His memoirs, Smriti Katha and travel accounts, Tibetar Pathe Himalaya, were published serially in Udbodhan and Basumti and later in book form. 
In 1906, when Abhedananda returned from America, he wanted Akhandananda to go with him to the West, but the latter declined. He preferred worshipping the poor living gods in the village rather than preaching Vedanta. He was respectful of the patriotism of Matsini and Garibaldi of Italy, and he was inspired by Florence Nightingale's and Booker T. Washington's spirit of service. He also had tremendous appreciation for the Indian national leaders such as Mahatma Gandhi, Balgangadhar Tilak and Chitranjan Das. He admired their self-sacrifice and service to the motherland. Ramakrishna never cared for narrow, bigoted, closed-minded people and his disciples resembled their master in this respect. They continually learned wherever they found anything good, beneficial and uplifting. Miss MacLeod once said to Akhandananda, People say Swamiji was a great teacher, but I and many others knew him to be a great learner. He learned from all, so he conquered all. He would always learn something, so he was always fresh, never monotonous, never repeating the same thing. 52 Akhandananda also learned continually, and as a result he had encyclopedic knowledge. He encouraged the monks to keep diaries. He said, if a monk travels in the Himalayas or any holy places, he should write in his diary vivid descriptions of those places and also record the conversations of holy people. At the end of the year, all monks should deposit those diaries at the monastery and some important things from their records could be published in the magazines of the order. It would enhance the knowledge of the monks as well as the public. 53 Swami Brahmananda passed away on 10th April 1922. On 2nd May 1922 Swami Shivananda became the President and Swami Akhandananda the Vice President of the Ramakrishna Order. One day in Belur Math, Akhandananda noticed a monk reciting the Gita, the Chandi and the Upanishads after his bath. A desire arose in his mind to follow the routine of the monastery. Suddenly he heard the master telling him, I have you and you have me. I pervade everything in this monastery. It is not necessary for you to chant in that manner. Eat, relax, move around and have some fun. You will not have to supervise anything here. When Akhandananda narrated his experience to Shivananda, the latter remarked, You are right, 54 a monk once wrote about Akhandananda's childlike nature. One day Gangadhar Maharaj came to the Udbodhan office. Everyone began to pester him, Maharaj, you must feed us rasagolas, cheese balls soaked in sira. Dot. Where is my money, he said. How can I feed you rasagolas? But one of the young monks knew he had some money hidden in the cloth around his waist, so he put his hand there and touched his cons. At this Akhandananda dragged him to Sardananda in the adjacent room and said, Look at this. What training have you given your boys? They want to extract a treat of rasagolas from me. Very good, answered Sardananda. Since they want it, why don't you feed them? I see, exclaimed Gangadhar Maharaj, you are also taking their side. In fact, he had brought that money to feed the monks with sweets. He was acting that way just to have some fun with us. He was also happy when we pestered him in that way. 55 In April 1926, the first convention of the Ramakrishna Math and Mission was held in Belur Math. Some direct disciples of the Master along with other monks and devotees discussed the past, present and future of the order. Akhandananda gave a talk on 7th April during the final session of the convention. The convention closes its sessions today. This is therefore the last occasion to speak to you in assembly. The wonderful life of the Godman Sri Ramakrishna the magnetic spell of whose hallowed name and teachings has drawn you all together here, the undying stories of this unique manifestation, his unprecedented renunciation, his unfathomed love, sympathy and toleration, 
and above all his infinite moods of spirituality. These and such other aspects of the Masle's life have been dwelt upon and interpreted by so many speakers in so many ways and will continue to be so done for how long who can say. But in thinking of him the idea that comes uppermost in my mind today is that the moment one saw him, one became transported to a spiritual elevation before which all distinctions and differences vanished, and even now if one could sincerely meditate upon the life or seriously think over and understand the true spirit of his harmony and toleration, one could no longer afford to cherish any bigoted or controversial ideas. Sri Ramakrishna was never for a moment heard to denounce anyone because of his religious belief or profession if only he were sincere. He took man at his best and always gave him a lift from the plane where he stood. If there was anything which he was never tired of denouncing most emphatically, it was hypocrisy. I remember one day a man denied the idea of the existence of God before him. And mark you what the Master, who was ever so deeply absorbed in ecstatic communion with the Divine Mother, said to him in reply, Well, who told you that there is God? I would not ask you to believe in any such idea. But then, you cannot with reason deny that there is a power working behind the universe. One may attribute any name to it, but it remains there all the same. Why not take it in that spirit and try to know more intimately what you believe in? Know this and be happy. To be sure, mere belief cannot give rest to your inner cravings. Knowledge, true knowledge of the mysteries of this phenomenal existence alone can do that. The same attitude of universal tolerance and sympathy for all irrespective of their religious beliefs and social or spiritual standing we find manifested in Swami Vivekananda. And upon us also, the humble disciples of the Master, the full implications of this idea began gradually to dawn. The Master and Swamiji are really one, the one spirit as it were, manifested in twin personalities. What we find in the Master in the form of a seed becomes fully developed in Swamiji. Swamiji is to Sri Ramakrishna what the commentary is to the Vedanta Sutras. The one is complementary to the other. They are in fact inseparable, the obverse and reverse of the same con. Sri Ramakrishna one day cried aloud from the housetop for those young spiritual seekers who were to come to him and pour forth their lives offerings on the altar of his service, and they came. But that cry has not ended there. It is still ringing through the air and shall continue for aeons. Many have come after that, many are still coming, and many more will come in the future. 56 Towards the end in 1934, after the passing away of Shivananda, Akhandananda became the president of the Ramakrishna order. From then on, he lived in both Belur Math and Sargachi, but spent most of his time in Sargachi. In January 1934 there was a devastating earthquake in Bihar and many people were killed. In April Akhandananda went to inspect the Ramakrishna mission's relief work there. His presence raised the morale of the people and he also inspired the monks to serve the afflicted as God. He returned to Belur Math on 10th May and then went to Sargachi in the last week of May. As president of the Ramakrishna order, Akhandananda initiated a large number of people. On 4th November 1934 he went to Bombay and then Nagpur, where he inspired many seekers of God. Once somebody asked the Swami, on whom shall I meditate first, the form of the Guru or the form of the Ishta, chosen deity? Where shall I concentrate? Akhandananda replied, Shri Ramakrishna is the Guru and He is the Ishta. There is no first or second about it. The heart is the best place for concentration. Think that you are seeing Him face to face. He is seated in your heart. 
those who are initiated can think of their own guru in the beginning if it helps them. There is no hard and fast rule. The only thing needful is constant recollectedness of the Lord. 57 Another time a devotee asked him if he had seen God. Akhandananda humbly replied, Yes, while I was in the Himalayas, I saw God face to face. 58 At the end of November Akhandananda returned to Calcutta and then on 3rd December 1934 he went to Sargachi. Sri Ramakrishna's centenary celebration was scheduled for February 1936. On 19 January 1936, Miss Josephine MacLeod went to the Sargachi Ashrama and said to the Swami, Give me your message for the coming centenary. Swami Akhandananda replied, I have no message of my own. But I have received this message from the Lord. I am infinite and eternal. What is my centenary? Miss MacLeod said, All right. One shall take this message with me. 59 However, the Belur Math authorities repeatedly wrote to Akhandananda to send a message, as the celebration was only a few days off. They reminded him that the President's message was extremely important for Ramakrishna's centenary. Akhandananda later described how he wrote the centenary message, that message was dictated by the Master. I was sleeping at night. The Master spoke from my heart, since they are asking you so much, why don't you write this message, truly, who can observe my centenary? I am infinite and eternal. I couldn't wait for morning to write. I am an old man. Lest I forget, I picked up a pen and pad and wrote down the message. 60 On 23rd February 1936 Akhandananda arrived at Belur Math and on 24th February he gave the inaugural message of the centenary. The following is the conclusion of the message, translated from Bengali. The dawn of the new age is breaking over the world, the blessed day that will illumine our hearts with the glory of its effulgence is at hand. Knowingly or unknowingly the human race is moving forward along the path of liberation inspired by Sri Ramakrishna's message of the harmony of all religions and by his unique realization of the essential oneness of karma, action, janana, knowledge, bhakti, devotion, and yoga, psychic control. The day is not far off when the whole world will witness the establishment of a universal kingdom of peace and when in loving response to the call of the Master, all people, forgetting their religious differences, will unite together and glorify the Master's message, as many faiths, so many paths. Then only will the meridian light of the Master's advent illumine the hearts of humanity. May the citizens of the world, on this blessed day, understand the meaning of the Master's coming and be hallowed. This and this alone is my fervent prayer. Peace, peace, and peace be unto all. 61 Akhandananda stayed in Belur for a month. His body was feeble and it was difficult for him to even walk. A doctor examined him and found that he had diabetes. Nevertheless, he returned to Sargachi and continued his spiritual ministry. Akhandananda loved his village ashrama dearly and never liked to be away from it for long. However, he cherished a desire to give up his body in Belur Math, where Vivekananda had installed the relics of the Master. The Swami's wish was providentially fulfilled. On 5th February 1937, a cable was sent to Belur Math to inform the monks of Akhandananda's serious condition. Two monks arrived from Belur Math the next day, and with the local doctor's approval, decided to take the Swami to Calcutta for treatment. As Swami Akhandananda was carried on a stretcher to the railway station, some farmers on the street tearfully said to him, Father, get well soon and come back. Akhandananda blessed them with a smile. The train left at 5 p.m., he fell unconscious on the way. The train arrived at Calcutta at 11 p.m. He was first taken to Udbodhan by ambulance, 
and then to Belur Math at midnight via Dakshineswar. His bed was made ready next to Vivekananda's room. Several doctors tried their utmost to save this great soul. At last, at 3.07 p.m. on 7th February 1937, Swami Akhandananda passed away at the age of 72. His body was cremated on the bank of the Ganges, close to Swamiji's temple in Belur Math. To see God in all beings is the culmination of the Vedantic experience. Swami Akhandananda had that experience, so he served all as God. A few years before his passing away, the Swami told a monk his life's philosophy. The Master has still kept me alive for his work. Distribute yourself among others and bring other souls within yourself. You will see how much joy you will get from it. On the other hand, if you are always busy about yourself, you will be entangled within yourself, you will kill yourself, and you will die. Not knowing the self is akin to suicide or death. The more you disseminate yourself among the people, the more you will attain bliss and that will lead you to self-realization. 62.